Um, thanks very much, um, um, Gail. So uh, what a pleasure to be uh, here again after having missed, unfortunately, this meeting last year. Um, and um, to be able to uh, share with you some, uh, some thoughts and see uh, the sort of great studies that uh, are, are going on. So yesterday was an absolutely phenomenal day. Um, as, as far as I'm concerned. So what I thought I would do um, 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 today, when the sort of last, uh, the last day of the meeting, and I think uh, what I would do is to try and uh, leave you with some um, food for thought uh, on your way home to think about a slightly different approach compared to what we've heard so far in relation to how we evaluate, how we design, in fact, and how we implement and evaluate interventions looking to improve or enhance or increase um, vaccination coverage. So, and to, to start off, let's start with this sort of rather cryptic um, term. How many of you have heard of implementation science before? Excellent. We're not so cryptic. So it's about 50% of the audience, which is great. Um, so what I thought um, I would start with here is, before I go into the sort of nitty-gritty of, of what we mean by implementation science and how it actually applies to the type of work that we've been discussing um, on the last sort of few hours, a couple of days rather, um, is to start with the very basic questions and that, that's what got me into implementation science. I mean, I've been doing work in so quality improvement, safety improvement in healthcare, including vaccination uptake, but not exclusively. Um, and this is the question that time and again we come back to, which is a sort of seemingly straightforward thing to do. Um, we've heard a lot in the last couple of days about trials. You've got the metrics. You've got a set of primary endpoints. Usually you've got your secondary endpoints. Um, vaccination uptake and, and attitudes towards it are two good examples of these type of endpoints. Um, but I thought, um, after having done this research over a number of years, well, let's try and think about what really what really this question is asking, because I, I think it's slightly more complex than it looks at, uh, uh, at first. So if we try and sort of dissect the question, just, just pull it apart word by word. So the, there's two words in there that, that, that sort of my intervention, because that applies to people who develop interventions, a lot of the audience um, in this meeting, myself included, fall into this category, um, uh, and the word actually. Actually means in real life. So... If I take the perspective of the researcher, which is my own personal perspective and, and a perspective that you've, you've, you've heard about quite a lot in this meeting, what I'm interested in is the intervention as I designed it, right? We are the trial designers. We are the intervention producers. So there's an element there of what we design, and there's another element of what actually gets delivered in practice, particularly for behavioral interventions. Behavioral interventions are not like drugs. They're not pharmacological interventions. In a drug, you know exactly what's going to go in it, provided that your production process is, is you know what it's in it, um, and it works. But for a behavioral intervention, we've heard yesterday about motivational interviewing, and this is something I'm involved um, with at the moment in a diabetes, management of diabetes 1, um, uh, type 1 diabetes trial. The way that our... our, our um, diabetes educators deliver motivational interviewing differs from educator to educator. So what we're trying to do is to reduce that difference. Otherwise, the intervention is not the same across the trial centers. So what gets delivered in practice versus what I have in my mind um, about my intervention is something quite important. And this brings us to this, this concept that we haven't discussed very much, but I think it's critical for the type of intervention that we're all talking about, which is the issue about the fidelity to the intervention versus adaptation in practice. And there is a tension there, which I'm experiencing day in, day out, when I talk to my clinical colleagues who actually, their remit is to take the interventions that we evaluate and apply it to our uh, region. The region that I work in is a sort of South London in England, and that's a catchment area of about three million people uh, who come in for all sorts of services, including obviously for uh, vaccination. And here is the tension on this slide. It's quite schematic and it's, there's a lot of gray areas, but I, I, I think it, uh, this conveys the point. From the perspective of the developer of the intervention or the scientist who evaluates whether something works or not through a trial, which is our current gold standard in this type of research, I'm interested in delivering with really high fidelity so I know exactly that what's delivered is what I thought would be delivered. Um, so it's intervention as intended. And this ensures effectiveness and ensures causal attribution. I'm able to say, well, actually, this didn't, wasn't delivered. That was my control group, and therefore, you know, I didn't get the effect. Great. But from the point of view of the guys who are actually designing and delivering and paying for, that's important, paying for services, what they're interested in is actually, does that work out on my patch? 
So they want to adapt what I give them to make sure it, they, they can actually deliver it. And they want to deliver it, therefore, as, as applicable and not just for six months or two years. That's my typical trial. They want to be doing it for forever. So they want to ensure that this sustainable ad infinitum, and that means that they need to think about their funding envelope and how they're going to develop the capacity to deliver those interventions. So you, uh, there's, there's an element of tension that we need to be aware of. And I'm going to come back to this. Um, the other part of this sentence, continuing this sort of surgical dissection of what, what we mean here, um, is this, the intervention. Well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Well, actually, it isn't. So there's this complex, uh, th sorry, there's this con um, um, concept in the literature that's come up in the last sort of few years, which is the, 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 the concept of a complex intervention. It's not complicated and it's not simple. Complex means that an intervention consists of multiple moving parts. And we deliver the intervention. And those moving parts interact with each other. And we need to figure out which of those parts are absolutely essential for our intervention, which we can do away with, because that would might make our intervention more easily implementable, and that is important. Um, and therefore, what the active ingredients, using the sort of pharmacological example, actually are. A lot of the times, we treat our interventions as a black box. We don't sort of look into what's in it, what's in them. And people argue that this is important. And I'll, I'll say a bit later about why this is um, the case. And finally, does something work or not? Well, works. Uh, there's, there's a very nice, um, there's a few nice papers, and some people call, call this a sort of realistic or realist approach to evaluating interventions, where they ask the question, if you ask the question, does something work, you're actually asking the wrong question. The right question to ask is, does something work for whom is your intervention actually working? How exactly? So what, how are these ingredients um, uh, working, as I said earlier? In what context it works? And in what context it actually might fail? Um, and with what, what are the unintended consequences of putting your intervention into practice? They, so the argument is that this is the question we need to be asking, which, of course, is a much more, a, a much more or, uh, difficult question um, uh, to be addressing. So effectively, what I'm hoping to, to um, have started to do is to, to try and persuade you that thinking about evaluating interventions is actually much more complex than it sounds like in the first instance. And the reason this is the case is because ultimately, we're not just interested in trialing interventions. We're interested in taking interventions that work well in trials and then scaling them up and implementing them over a long period of time over um, um, entire populations. So that's a direction that we're trying to, uh, to go. And this is why this is important. Now, in reality, if you look at any, um, um, any sort of standard textbook about innovation diffusion, um, about translational science, about um, uh, knowledge transfer from, from uh, the lab or from a trial, from a research setting, all the way to sort of you know, achieving public health impact, you have um, some sort of diagrams like this one. This has been around for about 20 years. Um, and there's a few others, but the, the, the cracks of it is, is, is the same. So you start down here. You start by generating the evidence. This is our thinking about what our interventions actually are. Uh, iPad-mediated interventions, we've heard video-mediated interventions, stories versus statistics, combinations thereof, motivational interviewing, um, um, uh, screening um, uh, people's attitudes before we tailor, and therefore tailoring our communications to them when they come in a vaccination consultation, all of that stuff gets us started up here. So we're generating evidence, we're producing evidence. And the evidence gets effectively published and disseminated. And then you start this, this arduous and often long-winded process of getting from the evidence into the practice. So what happens in primary care? What happens in, with our health visitors uh, discussing vaccinations? What happens in, um, 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 in the sort of antenatal clinics, what actually takes place in practice at the interface of, of um, um, healthcare uh, and um, um, the public or the patients. And there's as many steps in here as, as you like to think about. Different models postulate different numbers of steps. But the whole point is that this link is not automatic. And because it's not automatic, in fact, it takes effort. It takes meetings like this one where, where we, all, oops, we all get together. It takes communication between researchers and policymakers and service, um, service delivery um, uh, um, uh, people, effectively people designing and commission services. And in addition to all this, in order to do all of it, it takes some time, right? So it doesn't just happen. And what I argue here to you, and I'm not the first one, I'm probably one of, of, one of many, 
When you try and get into this translational pathway from the, 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 the um, production of the evidence to the delivery and the implementation of this evidence, you get this sort of sour face, or rather sad, frustrated um, um, scientist face. I uh, can put a lot of our faces um, 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 over his and say, well, actually, I've published X number of trials. I've got really good papers out there. Of those, how many have made it into routine care delivery, routine vaccination policy? Routine is important because it's not the exception that happens in a trial. It's routine. This is what reaches most people on most days. So what, what gets lost? Let's just um, uh, spell it out for a moment here. What I'm suggesting to you that's getting lost is, is the sort of, this is the, the mirror image of between real life and our sort of research settings. When you start in a research setting, and I'm using our city again as a gold standard, it's not just our cities. Um, my intention as the guy who's running the trials is to maximize the chances that my intervention will be um, um, effective. We're going to give every chance to this intervention of actually working. In order to do that, what you find in most trials, which is part of the major criticism that we have um, um, at the moment towards uh, trials, is you're very carefully selecting who's going to make it into your trial. You have very, very strict and very uh, specified selection criteria it, 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 uh, uh, for your participants. And then you make sure that when your intervention gets delivered, you get specialized researchers, you pay them to do it, you train them to do it, so they're really delivering, this is the high fidelity element, they really deliver what you think should be delivered. And of course, in order to do all of this, you've got a bit of funding from the government, from a research council, from the European Union and elsewhere, which is all great. But here is where we translate. And let's see, let's jump ship now and let's go into the blue box, which is real life, right? So in real life, your intention is not to maximize the chances that something's going to work. It's to maximize the chances you're actually going to be able to do it day in and day out. And you're going to do it, uh, so therefore you want to, to have widespread adoption for your all, all of your catchment areas. So my colleagues are not interested in the sort of 1,000 people or even sort of the 6,000 people what we've tested in a recent large trial that was a sort of surgical trial. They're interested in doing this across the three million catchment area uh, that, that, um, that they have, whatever the services, those services might be. Um, and therefore, um, the, and the other thing, of course, they're interested in doing is you're not going to have specialized researchers coming in and do it. They're going to have their staff. Now, the staff that they have come, come in with their own expertise. They come in with their own abilities. They come in with their own um, job descriptions. The guys who deliver vaccination, they're not only delivering vaccinations. They're doing all sorts of other things. Right? So this is part of what they do, but this is not their only job. And obviously, they have to do it within the funding envelope that they have. They have a budget to deliver a service. Within that budget, they might need to put in our additional intervention because that's, that's what we um, keep asking them to do because apparently it works. So what this results in, I'm arguing to you, is a gap between what we do in science, in research centers, and in universities, and labs, and what happens in daily practice in the hospital down the road, as we, uh, uh, we are all here arguing about research and evidence and vaccination. So there is a gap there, and the gap is deadly. And the reason it's deadly is I'm arguing that in some occasions, people are actually losing their lives because we're not applying the best evidence to um, um, the, the care that we deliver to them, and to public health interventions. Uh, that we deliver to them. So if I were to ask you, and you might disagree with this, but let's assume for a moment, for the sake of my talk, that you agree. How many, how long is this gap, you think? How many years does it take to cross the bridge from the lab to patient care, on average? Someone's read my slides. Um, <laughs> or has read the evidence. So, um, seven, you just kill the discussion. and might as well go on to the next slide table. Um, <laughs> So the average is, and it's debated, and it's, uh, you know, as with all these numbers, it's probably inaccurate. So every time you hear that here is a number, typically this number's got a massive sort of error, bars, um, um, uh, error bar attached to it. But this is the average, and this is the paper where you can actually find it. This was estimated by RAND Europe um, a few years back. Um, so this is why, this, and this is unacceptable. So th there is no question that you would show this to anybody in their right minds and say, with all the millions that we spend in research, developing interventions, um, well, how much of it are we, can we take some of that budget and actually spend it in getting the interventions across the other side? We need to get them here, uh, because otherwise, we, we are, the mortality and morbidity um, that we're, we're incurring is unacceptable. So for those of you who visit London, we keep telling you this to make sure you don't fall through the cracks. Inevitably, some people do. Um, um, 
And it's not just about minding the gap. I mean, the reason I'm identifying this is not just because we need to be mindful of it. What I'm arguing to you is that we need to be doing something to make it shrink, to achieve um, um, uh, speediness in translating evidence into practice. And the good news from my perspective, uh, and I discovered this only a few years ago, um, is that we do have an approach that allows us to do that, and this is what implementation science is about. So the, a, a fairly well accepted definition, we use this in the journal, uh, is that implementation science is a scientific study of methods that promote the uptake of research findings, broadly defined, into routine um, uh, care. Uh, uh, the perspective you can take is either clinical, so frontline facing, organizational or policy context, so it's, it extends quite broadly. Um, the NIH in the US has a slightly more detailed definition, which I think is, is great, that conveys some of the concepts that we work with. Implementation research is about um, uh, supporting innovative approaches to identifying, understanding, and overcoming is an applied science. So we try to overcome barriers to, adopt, to the adoption, adaption, integration, scaling up, and sustainability of an evidence-based intervention. And what I'm arguing to you is that it's better if we take all of these things into account at the time when we design those interventions and we design those trials, rather than just leave them aside and revisit them uh, once our trials are done. So how do we do that? This has been an interesting development. It was mentioned yesterday in one of the slides. I think it was, where is Kath? Here is Kath. Um, um, Kath had a version of this in her slides yesterday, and some of you might have picked it up. This is a model, a framework, it's not a model, is the framework that our Medical Research Council has come up with. So it's the great and the good locked up in a room like this one over a number of days, over a number of years. This framework goes back about 15 years now, and we're in its third iteration. And this is the, that is the actual framework. This is what's in this uh, BMJ paper of last year. Anything in blue here falls under implementation research. So the classic model is that if you're thinking of, of, of an evaluation of, uh, or, or of an intervention, you put the intervention in place and then you go straight on to look at your outcomes. This is how you power your study. Uh, this is how you, you, you uh, uh, set out your primary endpoints. The argument here is that we need to look at all these uh, bits uh, shaded in blue. So what we really want to know is how did this intervention get put into place? So we need to do an implementation analysis. And what does that mean? Well, this means that we need to know how the process of implementation took place, how people delivered um, um, the intervention, how was the iPad um, um, uh, provided to people, how was the motivational interview put into place, uh, how was the consultation delivered, and so on and so forth. We need to know what they actually delivered, so what was the fidelity in comparison to the original design of the intervention, any adaptations that took place, reach, how many people we uh, achieved to deliver the intervention to of those eligible, so that's a fraction, I'm going to come back to this and so on. When you have this, then you can start building clever statistical models, um, and we have um, uh, epidemiologists in the audience, you start building models where you put implementation in as a factor. You can put it in as an interaction. You can study effectiveness as a function of quality of implementation. And this is what a lot of our studies at the moment are about. The argument being that an intervention that's largely behavioral in nature, uh, its efficacy or its effectiveness will depend on the quality of its delivery, how much of it gets delivered and how many people uh, actually receive it of those entitled to it. And when you do all of that, you also need to take into account the context in which you work. And how do you do that? There's a number of validated scales that allow you to look at things like readiness for implementation or leadership for implementation. There is ethnographic approaches that we use to study the clinical setting uh, in which an intervention gets, gets delivered. Because the argument here is that unless we understand the context, we do not understand um, uh, what might uh, prove to be a barrier uh, or what facilitates our intervention from being from being applied. And one, one uh, I think it's useful as a, as a sort of summary, uh, if you like, uh, intervention, uh, sorry, a summary description of um, how we approach implementation is this. The, the success of an implementation, the success of putting an intervention into place is a function of its actual effectiveness as being published or being estimated in a trial and these implementation factors. So what are these implementation factors? What do we actually talk about? This is a fairly well accepted short list of what the implementation measures that we ought to be interested in, they ought to be collecting are. So we need to know how acceptable the intervention is, the level of the uh, adoption, so intention to apply the intervention, how appropriate it is for the population, 
that we're targeting, how feasible it is to be delivered on a, on a, on a regular basis in our, in our um, uh, the services that, that it is intended for, the fidelity with which it can be delivered, the costs, a lot of people are asking about this and we don't have the data, the costs of training personnel, the costs of getting experts to deliver interventions if we need to, the coverage that we achieve, that's the fraction, how many of those eligible actually receive it, and of course the higher the better, uh, and of course sustainability um, over time. In order to maximize now practically this, in order to maximize the chances of your implementation working, we have what people have described as implementation strategies. And those of you in sort of social marketing will recognize some of them. Uh, this is a fairly hybrid area of work. In implementation strategies, basically a method or a technique that you can use to enhance implementation, to enhance adoption, to enhance sustainability. The sort of things that you find in the literature, some of them are here. This is a great summary of, of them. Um, but you're talking about adapting and tailoring interventions, offering training and education, using champions at the front line for championing your intervention, uh, and a huge body of evidence around audit and feedback. Auditing what happens in the clinical service and then providing feedback to uh, frontline staff. Finally, uh, and this is sort of my parting shot, in order to do all of this, we need to, to um, 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 uh, have a multidisciplinary team in place. It's important to approach the trials with an open mind, the qualitative and quantitative science, and this is what we're trying to do uh, with a number of interventions that we're designing now um, and evaluating now in our group. But effectively, the take-home message for me is that producing evidence alone will never equate with the evidence being uptaken and, and, and improvement achieved uh, at the front line. And therefore, I hope that implementation science is offering a useful framework to think about these issues and actually address them. Thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to be here and share these thoughts. I'm very happy to have questions.